Hey everyone, I just played Sagebrush and it was genuinely scary. Not because it was flush with jump scares, it wasn't. Not because you're constantly stalked by some invincible monster, although there is one, but because the horror at the heart of the title was truer than any scary game I've played in years. So let's talk about it. But before I get my hands into the guts of this game, just a quick heads up. I'm going to be spoiling everything about this game. There are going to be flashing lights at certain certain points in the video too. It's also going to cover certain topics that some may find disturbing. You can find timestamps for the flashing lights and content warnings down in the description. Also, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and share the video around because YouTube sure as hell won't. Let's get to it. Sagebrush was released in 2018 by Nathaniel Behrens, otherwise known as Redact Games. It's set on Black Sage Ranch, hidden away in the remote New Mexico desert and tells the tale of the cult, Perfect Heaven, that called it home. The cult is long gone and long dead by the start of the game. The opening moments make it clear that they took their own lives back in the early 90s. All that's left of them are the memories scattered around the compound, the public teachings hung on bulletin boards, the private thoughts written in journals, the empty spaces filled with tools that no one ever returned to pack up. It's a lived-in space haunted by the absence of its inhabitants. It's also a story you've probably heard before, both in fiction and in real life. Hearing the premise immediately brings to mind numerous real cults that ended in similarly violent ways. The People's Temple, the Branch Davidians, Heaven's Gate, the stories of which have been sensationalized and even mythologized by the media in the decades since their occurrence. Whether you know them only by reputation or have done a deep dive into the topic, there are certain pre conceptions about cults that are impossible to avoid going into a game like Sagebrush. Yet the deeper you delve into the story, the more the compound and its cult members unfurl open like some kind of ornamental lockbox, you discover the horror is rooted in the mundane rather than the fantastic. And because of that, Sagebrush is refreshingly subversive. Let's put a pin in that for now and talk about the gameplay. As you may have noticed, Sagebrush is a walking simulator and hey, no, hey, Hey, come back. Just hear me out. I'm well aware walking simulators are a divisive topic within the gaming community, but there are some stories that can only really be told well within the framework of the genre. You could do Sagebrush as a movie or a novel, sure, but something would be lost if the story were to be told through a passive medium. It needs that interactive element. It needs the open space of the compound and the vast distances between each important area to give the player is time to think about what they've just uncovered, about all the little moments of environmental storytelling that Sagebrush never explicitly says out loud, and whether or not you can keep going even though you already know how the story ends. As with most walking simulators, there isn't much to the gameplay. You can examine a lot of things, and even pick up important items like keys and tools, but that's about it. There are some puzzles to solve, some notes to pick up, some very slight inventory management when selecting what key goes into what lock, some places even have lights to turn on, but the vast majority of the game will be spent exploring the compound. You can't even jump or crouch, but you can run, which is a godsend once you learn the layout of the place. And you get a torch, which is great because this game is dark. There's an annotated map you can find as well, which is actually pretty useful. It gives the sense of the ranch as this enormous space, the kind of size you'd expect it to be in real life. But in actual gameplay, everything is condensed down to make the long journeys between each area more manageable. It's still a long way between each part of the compound if you choose to walk, but the running speed was such that I never felt bored or held back. Sagebrush's gameplay might be simple, but it's effective, and I was surprised to discover there were some moments where I found it difficult just to press on, where the atmosphere became so unsettling that the simple act of pressing W on the keyboard became as difficult as wandering down a dark alley in the middle of the night. I think that speaks to just how good Sagebrush's presentation is. The game's store page describes its art style as low-poly, low-resolution, 
resolution and less is more, which I think hits the nail perfectly on the head. There's something just inherently creepy about 90s 3D graphics. It's a weird mix of simple shapes and surprising detail that when thrown together just come off as unsettling. Or at least it does to me. It's like an inversion of the uncanny valley, something that looks obviously fake but is just real enough to make your brain go, huh, things just don't quite look the way they should. Shapes distort depending on how far away from them you are. And for all that detail crushed into the textures, you still have to use your imagination to fill in the blanks. Sagebrush is such a still game that whenever the environment distorts around you just through the nature of its own low fidelity, it's impossible not to find movement where there actually isn't any, especially at a distance. The first time I caught sight of this swarm of flies buzzing around this barn door, ignore the blood, I thought, what the hell is that? Because from far away, it looked like a demon coming to slurp my face off. But for how distorted the world is, it is undeniably beautiful. Look at that sunset. Look at the night sky. Look at the church at the top of the hill. Look at the compound stretching out beneath it. For how dark and desperate the game's story gets, its setting is gorgeous. It's a beautiful afternoon. You can almost feel the warmth of the sun through the pixels, and it creates a stark contrast with how gloomy every single interior is. As a result, the passage from late afternoon afternoon, to sunset, to night, feels less like a beautiful day coming to an end, and much more as though the darkness of the cult and its history is spreading out from the abandoned buildings it left behind into the ground itself, consuming you, swallowing you whole. It's not the only way the game plays with lighting either. No light bulb ever illuminates as much space as you'd like, and before finding the batteries for the flashlight you basically have to go into every area you come across half blind. There are moments where it uses light as a guide, such as in its opening moments with the headlights of your vehicle pointing directly at the fence you need to cut apart in order to enter the ranch. But where the game's lighting shines brightest is when you interact with one of these tape decks. The whole world turns black and white, distorted by a filter of static as if from an old VHS tape that has been watched again and again and again and again and again. And everything goes dark except for the focus of the tape's story. It forces you to look at what it wants you to see. There is no turning away from it. Even switching on your torch just brings the tape's subject into sharper focus. And it lasts just long enough so that when everything suddenly snaps back to normal, it's jarring. It's such a perfect visual representation of getting lost in your own thoughts to the point where everything fades away until you're suddenly ripped back into the moment. It helps that the audio logs recorded on the tapes are really well written and really well performed. Most of the game's dialogue belongs to Lillian, played by Sarah Behrens, and she absolutely kills it in the role. It never comes off like scripted dialogue. The performance comes off as genuine, like she's sitting right next to you telling a story, to the point where you can hear facial expressions like smiles or frowns, despite her just being a disembodied voice on a tape deck. I often helped Viola in the schoolhouse. I enjoyed working with the children. We taught them reading, writing, scripture. Viola was one of the most faithful among us. If Anne was like the mother of the flock, Viola was the older sister. I remember one lecture she gave the children on the nature of hell that was so vivid, so unflinching, it had the kids in tears. I told her she was scaring them, and she said, good, they should be scared. The second most prominent part is Father James, the leader of the cult, who is played by Nathaniel Behrens, the developer. He's able to find this weird balance between a charismatic priest and an awkward man unused to public speaking, who comes off as a little unsure of himself despite the confidence that radiates off his written sermons. My flock, I have wondrous news. The days of reckoning are upon us. 
There are a couple of other voice roles, but they're only momentary and they don't really get enough time to shine. They're fine for what they are. Where the sound really excels is in the ambient noise. It's quiet, but not unnaturally so. While travelling through the compound you can hear the buzz of insects, or the distant cries of coyotes, or some birdsong on the wind. The crops rustle as you wander through the rows, the grass and sand crunch underfoot. It's only when you go inside that everything settles down into an unnerving silence. Even then, the walls are thin. You can hear the rattle of old generators chugging away outside if you make the effort to turn them on. Black Sage Ranch might have been abandoned after Perfect Heaven's violent end, but the natural world has already started creeping back in to replace that human presence. It's not like some cursed place out of a generic horror movie where even the animals don't want to go near it, it's just a ruin. It's a very naturalistic soundscape despite the lo-fi visuals, and it creates some such a specific tone that when things do start getting a little more intense later on in the game, you feel the shift in atmosphere on a visceral level. Sagebrush also features a few music tracks but it uses them sparsely, usually in conjunction with the passage of time or the revelation of a big plot moment. It's a very melancholic, very haunted soundtrack that's able to dredge up images of the cult's past injustices and gives you a few moments to stew in the knowledge the ones responsible will never be held accountable, but there's also a nostalgic element to the music that brings to mind the sense of community and inclusiveness of Perfect Heaven which, now that they're gone, can never be recaptured. The synth tones help create such a mood that when stereotypical gospel music does appear, it's almost shocking. One of the first things you do in the game is restore power to the community hall, and after exploring the place in near-perfect silence, to suddenly hear an old scratchy record of hymns burst to life is pretty creepy. It's a great moment of environmental storytelling, a reminder that while the members of Perfect Heaven might be dead and gone, their ghosts still haunt the ranch they once called home. Which I guess brings me to the story. Sagebrush's plot is kind of difficult to talk about because it's not told in a linear series of events. It's much closer to a jigsaw puzzle where you're given all the pieces but much of the matter of putting them together is left up to the player. It's not a particularly hard puzzle, there are only a handful full of pieces and the way they fit together is intuitive if you've encountered this kind of story before. But it's also the reason I think Sagebrush works best as a walking simulator rather than a film or a book. The game begins with a short cinematic of headlights driving through the New Mexico desert narrated by Lillian. I met Anne first, waiting for the bus. Normally I avoid talking to just about anybody but she struck up the conversation. She was so pleasant, so confident. She smiled at me as if she had known me as a kid and we were just catching up after all these years. She told me she could tell I had a hole in my life. She knew what that was like, she said. 
She had also had a hole, but it was gone now. Who you are and why you've come to Black Sage Ranch is never stated, but you're here now. And who among us has never wanted to explore a place like the abandoned home of a long dead cult? After breaking into the compound with a pair of wire cutters, you're funneled to the ranch's community hall. The building serves as a short tutorial for the game's handful of mechanics. There are notes and items scattered all over the place, including the first tape deck, but many of them are impossible to read in such darkness. It's only after after restoring the power and turning on a light or two that you get a proper sense of the place and where Sagebrush's environmental storytelling really kicks into gear. I've already spoken about the record player that suddenly hums back to life when you switch on the generator but there are so many other things like the bulletin board of introductions filled with fun facts and declarations of how happy everyone is to have found a place to fit in after feeling lost for so long. The bookshelves packed with young of conspiracy literature and contradictory versions of the cult's homemade apocrypha, the Book of Sariel. Even something as simple as the choice of Bible quotes in the toilets. The men's room has this very innocuous and very short passage about keeping clean, John 13 10. But the wall of the ladies' room has a long quote from Leviticus 15 about how menstruating women are filthy. In amongst the otherwise mundane notes on meal plans and performance schedules and recruitment pamphlets, there are vague references to something called the cleansing shed, too. It's the little things like that which get under your skin. So much of what you find is just normal that when the weird stuff jumps out at you, it's so much more effective than if Sagebrush had leaned hard into the pop culture perception of a crazy cult. Compare Outlast 2, which is also set in the compound of a cult hidden away in the remote American desert. It engages with a lot of the same themes as Sagebrush, but without any sense of restraint. You have this sprawling compound filled with evil cultists. There are piles of dead children everywhere, everyone speaks in Bible passages, nothing is left up to the imagination, and absolutely everything is held right up to the lens to make absolutely sure that you understand what it's trying to say, which ultimately is nothing. It's so over the top, fighting so hard to be shocking the way the first game was, that it just comes off as try hard. It's all just too much. The compound is just too big and too expensive to ever exist at the hands of a fringe religious group, even with the financial aid of a faithful whale. And its practices are too extreme to ever gather such a large following, even with the excuses the game offers by way of explanation, and everyone comes off as a caricature, rather than an actual character. Sagebrush does a lot of the same things, but in a much more believable way. Black Sage Ranch is big, but it's not that big, and it's mostly empty. There's a huge church looming over the compound at the top of a hill, and Father James has a nice house nearby, but the trade-off is there's no money left for other accommodation. Everyone else has to live in trailers. Perfect Heaven has some horrifying ideas about sin and absolution, but they're not beyond the realm of possibility. The sense of community and belonging and personal faith seen through the notes left behind by the cult members members makes it obvious why they stayed. They are people and they're written as people. Take Leonard, whose faith in perfect heaven helped him overcome his substance abuse, for a little while at least. Take Viola, who came to perfect heaven with her children fleeing an abusive husband and is willing to do anything to fit in. Take Andrew, who loves his brother but wishes he would just take a moment to listen to what Father James has to offer. Take Juliet, Viola's 11 year old daughter, who hates living in the cult but can't get away and so rebels any way she can. Take Father James, who hides his doubts from his devoted flock and leaves the recruitment side of things up to his wife. Anne. Take Lillian, who has her own doubts about the cult, but remains anyway, because by now, it's family. Sagebrush's store page states the developer did extensive research while making the game, and I believe it. The quality of the writing and the willingness to engage with its setting and themes in a realistic way is proof of all that work. It's clear on the screen before you even leave the community hall or get a strong sense of the characters. It all just seems so normal. 
Sure, there are one or two things an outsider like the player might look at and go, huh, that's kind of weird, but there's nothing here to suggest the cult would one day end in a mass suicide. Then you find the key to the rest of the compound, and everything becomes a lot clearer. Not that all the game's horror is done through implication. There are a couple of literal descents into the realms of terror, such as this moment where you take the long, long elevator down into Black Sage Ranch's mine. To even enter the mine, you have to smash open this wall left as a warning by those who came before you with an axe, and after the 10 second ride down you're spat out into an old tunnel full of flickering yellow lights. All the sounds of nature you've grown used to over the course of the game are crushed under the hum of a deep subterranean drone, and then… the lights go out. Yeah, no. There's no escaping back up the elevator shaft because the power's dead. You're trapped down here. Alone. Hopefully. Have fun finding a way back out. The mine is one of those moments I mentioned earlier where on my first time through, I found it hard to even muster up the courage just to press the W key and continue forward. It is a great moment of horror, and it did it all without a jump scare or even a monster. It's at this point I'm going to be getting into spoilers, so if you want to play the game yourself, do so now. Sagebrush is pretty cheap and only a couple of hours long. It's more than worth it, or you can skip to here in the video to get to the conclusion. Abandon hope, ye who enter here. The best part of the mines is that it's a trick. It is completely optional, something you might only know if you've played the game through once before, but even then, the place on the ranch it points you toward is something you might stumble onto completely by accident. It's not like it's hidden, it's right there on the map from the very start. It's entirely possible to find it before you're meant to, and, in fact, I did on my first playthrough. I just didn't have the right tool to dig it up at the time. This is what I love about Sagebrush's story. Keys and codes and other important items do lock you into a vague progression path, but the game is more than happy to let you explore the ranch in whatever way you want, and the more you explore the compound, the more it becomes obvious that the community at Black Sage Ranch was starting to rot long before they took their own lives. Sin is thy debt, and earthly pain is thy currency, so said the Angel Sariel to Father James during the first revelation. The term cleansing is mentioned many times in notes around the ranch, but it's only once you find the key to the blood-stained barn and head inside that you discover what it means. It means blue tarpaulins, racks of sharp tools stained with blood, and swarms of flies. Whenever a member of Perfect Heaven sinned, they would come to the cleansing shed to be absolved through corporal punishment and self-harm. A sin so consequential in life outside the compound, such as taking the Lord or even Father James's name in vain, could only be forgiven through five cuts from a large knife. Something as innocent as reading a secular book bought outside Black Sage Ranch might cost you your eyes. Even just doubting your faith would cost you five cuts with a small knife. It's a horrific system made that much more disturbing by the fact everyone participated in it willingly, but it's hardly the only terrible aspect of Perfect Heaven. Wandering Black Sage Ranch, you get the sense Father James hoped for more followers. So much of it is empty. There's a large schoolhouse with over a dozen desks, but the game makes it clear there were only ever four students. The cult tried to become self-sustaining, but after the crops failed had to resort to stockpiling canned goods and rationing just to keep people fed. You can imagine him standing on the balcony out the front of the church, observing his petty little kingdom filled with doubt. If he truly had been shown the path to heavenly ascension, why were so few willing to follow? You can find a diary of his in which he recounts a dream where he does battle with Satan and wins, and even in this private space it comes off like he's trying to convince himself of his own beliefs. Because that's the thing, Father James was a true believer. He genuinely believed he was a prophet of God, so when the angel happens to say things that contradict each other, or allow him to partake in certain sins like extramarital sex, who is anyone, least of all him, to disagree? From the outside 
looking in, it's easy to see Father James's excuses and delusions for what they are. He can dress it up as alternative cleansing and claim, not to boast you understand, that as the only fully cleansed man in the compound, he alone can administer this new form of absolution to anyone who desires it. But in truth it's still just a lot of mental gymnastics to justify sleeping with the women of his cult, even if they're already married. The Lord called upon many women to provide succor and relief. Now those of you with husbands may be rightly confused. Is this not a sin? I ask you, do you not love the Lord more than your husband? Would you deny the Lord himself your love? I am his flag bearer. And if everyone was willing to go along with blood cleansing, and if everyone is willing to go along with this, it's only a small step further down the path to recording the sessions of alternative cleansing for, I don't know, further study I guess? And again, everyone goes along with it. His wife is banished to a camping bed in the storage room under the stairs, but she doesn't complain, doesn't mean to complain. It's cold, and it's damp, and it's hard to sleep, but it's worth it. Lillian states she knows full well what Father James is doing, she just doesn't care, because it feels good to be wanted. I was home. Do you know how good it feels to find home after so long? I would have done anything for Father. Father James took a special interest in me. He said he felt spiritually invigorated by my presence, and often called me to the rectory to spend time with him. Not dumb, I knew, but I didn't care. I was so honored to be his chosen. As the game goes on, you learn a lot more about Father James. More than you'd probably like. To start with, his name is actually Donald McKittrick. A born-again veteran of Vietnam, high on religion, and certain other substances. The guy is a massive hypocrite with a monumental messiah complex, who keeps boxes of adult magazines, and who knows what else hidden around his house. Which might explain why he had a fence put up around his little corner of the property. He didn't want any of the men finding out about his little indulgences, given his status as a fully cleansed individual. No wonder he left the recruiting to his wife. And for all the sexual abuse and physical abuse and substance abuse going on in the open or behind closed doors, it's not enough. It'll never be enough. His appetites will never be sated. Father James is a vile person, but he's also very human, and that's what makes him such an effective, believable villain. He's a monster. The kind of monster you can actually meet in real life. But he's not the one haunting you throughout the game. It eventually becomes clear that the cult was under investigation from the FBI, and not without reason. The group was stockpiling weapons deep underground and training everyone to use use them, even the children, just in case the feds came knocking at the front gate. The FBI's man on the inside, Peyton, reached out to Lillian in the hopes of pulling her away from the cult, and they did come to trust each other. You can find the positive effects he had on her life at Black Sage Ranch all over her trailer. She changed the lock on her door, as he had, to avoid any invasions of privacy from Father James's master key. You can find a real-life pamphlet about the characteristics of a cult written by the International Cult Studies Association inside her trailer, as well as notes from other Perfect Heaven members telling her to ignore her doubts. They had secret meeting spots, and left items for each other to find within them. He gave her a real shot of getting out, but it wasn't to be. Around the same time, Father James had a vision of a deceiver amongst the flock, and set the women he regularly slept with the task of using their bodies to root out the rat. Whether or not Father James had a man of his own inside the FBI, or if it was just a coincidence, is never stated, but it's a moot point anyway. You find Peyton's body at the bottom of the mine, left to rot in the darkness among the cult's impressive armory. Whether or not Lillian actually informed the cult of Peyton's treachery, she blames herself for his death. Yet, at the time, his disappearance came and went without comment. One day he was there, the next he wasn't. Peyton's death fractured the cult. Leonard couldn't deal with the guilt of the murder and fell back into his alcoholism. The FBI's interest in the cult scared the hell out of Father James, which scared the hell out of everyone else. No one left, not even Lillian, but whatever stability the compound had, vanished. Which is what directly led to the cult's final moments. 
the whole time the church has been perched atop a hill at the back of the ranch. You can see it from pretty much everywhere in the compound and it's done nothing but taunt you from the very first moments of the game. By the time you find the key to unlock its front doors, the sun has long since set. The whole ranch is blanketed in darkness, unless you've flipped any switches along the way. But what should you see at the top of the hill as you exit the rectory for the last time? But a light, shining from within the church. It makes you think for just a moment. Maybe you're not alone here. Maybe there is someone else left in the compound. But then you unlock the door, and the light goes out, and the church is empty. Of course it is. Everyone else is long gone. Left on the altar is the final tape deck, but instead of a moment to get lost in Lillian's thoughts, there's fire and smoke and the shadows of the dead. Father James's final sermon where he says it's time to leave this world behind in the ultimate expression of faith, and then Lillian's admission that she helped hand out the spiked cups of water to numb the pain while Andrew and Leonard locked the doors and set the church on fire. It's such a striking moment, even if it did make my computer chug the frame rate down to a slideshow. The whole game the tape decks have been colourless, fuzzy, introspective, like trying to remember a face or a moment that's just out of reach. The final tape is vivid in its remembrance, vibrant in its colours, as bright and bold as the day it happened, and it is horrifying. It might be the best jump scare I've ever come across, but it is not where Sagebrush ends. Lillian refused to die. She fled the fire for the safety of Father James's temple, a bunker built underneath the hill, and it is here, as you descend into that hidden metal box, that the game pulls its final twist. You are not some nameless observer who stumbled onto the compound. The player character is not a blank slate onto which you can project. You're playing as Lillian. You always have been. To discover you've been in the company of someone who not only was a member of the cult, but was complicit in its abuses, is such a gut punch if you're invested. But that revulsion is nothing compared to what Lillian is putting herself through. At the back of the bunker, you find another door, leading deeper underground. At the bottom bottom is another door leading even deeper, and at the bottom of that tunnel is another door forcing you deeper and deeper and deeper. Instead of the electric hum of the bunker, the tunnels fill with the sounds of clanking metal, as if you're travelling through the guts of some immense machine that could crush you like a can at any moment. Your torch dies, forcing you to navigate by the red hellish light shining out from behind the crosses hanging on the walls. There's no turning back. If you try Try, you'll find all the doors are locked. All you can do is keep going. Father James might have been a monster, but he was mortal, and he's long dead. This descent into the depths of hell is your encounter with the real monster that has been haunting the player since the opening moments of the game. Something invulnerable, but no less true to life. Lillian's guilt. Her guilt that she failed to save her friends. Her guilt that she didn't die with them. Her guilt for her part in all the horrible things Father James made them do. I love this sequence, not just because it's horrifying the first time through, but because it's so unexpected. Sagebrush has shown such restraint for so long. Even the trip through the mine is just a trick of sound and lighting, and it lulls you into thinking the climax is already over with the intensity of the final tape deck in the church. But that's the thing about these sorts of moments when the intrusive thoughts win. They sneak up on you, open a mental door without thinking, and suddenly they're all there, spilling into your train of thought, almost like you're drowning in them, sinking in them down to hell. And since all of this is in Lillian's head, the game can finally let loose in a proper nightmare sequence that had me banging on the doors to get out. I suppose I should have seen it coming. The first thing I did in my original playthrough was turn around and try to leave, but the game refused. No, it said. There's nothing but dirt roads and dust that way. You have to go inside. Every time you check a mirror, the only response you get is, you look tired. The signs were always there. Returning to the church and the bunker beneath it just pushed everything over the edge. And it's in this moment that we learn what happened to Lillian afterward, how she hid her involvement in the cult's mass suicide from the police, the estrangement she experienced from her family. Lillian, was it something we did? Dad. I just don't understand how you could run off and join some insane cult. The years of therapy to overcome her survivor's guilt. The embarrassment she felt about that part of her life. 
I, I couldn't find work, so I uh, ended up backpacking through Europe for a year after college. Oh, cool. I always wanted to do something like that. I bet it was amazing. Yeah, it was super fulfilling to see all those different ways of life. Really eye-opening. God, that was a long time ago. Man, I'm jealous. It was all too much. Eventually something had to give. She had to go back. She had to find closure. And at the end of this long and vivid nightmare, she finds not some demonic incarnation of her guilt, but the bunker as she had left it years ago, and the strength to move on. When you leave the bunker and return to the church, you discover an ashen husk gutted long ago by fire, and the first rays of dawn peeking over the horizon. It's here that Sagebrush ends, not with Lillian still trapped in the past with her guilt bottled up and pressurised to bursting point, but on the road to healing and a willingness to open up about her past to her partner. The last thing you hear are the same words Lillian spoke at the game's very beginning. I met Anne first, waiting for the bus. Normally, I avoid talking to just about anybody, but she struck up the conversation. It's a story she's told herself a million times before in the lonely confines of her own mind, but now she gets to put it into words and let it go. It's only appropriate that the tape deck sounds like she's been sitting beside you telling a story. She has been, the whole time. Sagebrush is a descent into a kind of hell that a lot of people struggle with in real life, whether they know it or not. It's restrained, realistic examination of cults and the trauma done to their victims is scarier to me than any monster in any horror game could ever be. There were moments in this game that left me dreading the need to press on, and Sagebrush managed it without combat, without gratuitous spectacle, and with very few jump scares. Does it have problems? Yeah, of course. There were graphical glitches now and then, it was kind of hard to highlight certain objects sometimes, you can Skyrim your way up mountains, and it did chug a bit occasionally, but really those are just nitpicks. In terms of atmosphere, in terms of storytelling, in terms of presentation, I don't have a bad word to say about it. Some might find the very simple gameplay off-putting, and clearly some have because there are more users on Steam with the achievement you get for reaching the end credits than the one you get for experiencing the game's climax, but I don't think Sagebrush could have been done any other way. In a medium that prides itself on excess, even in independent titles, Sagebrush's restraint and maturity is a breath of fresh air. The horror at its heart is something everyone will struggle with at some point in their lives, even if the variables will most certainly be different. Sagebrush isn't just one of the best walking simulators I've ever played, it's one of the best horror stories I've ever experienced. Even though it's been weeks since I first played it, I haven't been able to get it out of my head. So if you've never understood the appeal of the genre's gameplay, maybe give it a go. It might surprise you. It's short, it's sweet, it's scary, and it would be downright sinful to give this hidden gem a miss. And that's the video. Okay, so this is not the Halloween project I wanted to do this year. If you didn't see my recent post, I was going to do a video on Virus It Is Aware, but I severely underestimated how much I have to say on that topic, so we're going to save that for next year. The big project I'm focusing on now is the Trespasser Critique, and hopefully that'll be out in December or January. In the meantime, there will probably be one or two shorter videos like this one to bridge the gap, so be sure to watch out for them too. Too. Anyway, I've started reviewing books again on my other channel, Monotom Reads, so if you still find yourself needing to scratch that spooky season itch, I've just put up a big review of the Book of Cthulhu that you can watch right now. There's a link for it down in the description below. Happy Halloween, and I'll see you soon. Thanks for watching.